Artificial sweeteners, known more recently as non-nutritive or low-calorie sweeteners, have been a great hope. What could be better than enjoying sweetness in foods, but without the calories? Sucralose, xylitol, stevia, saccharin, aspartame, there are a lot of them out there. You may add them to food yourself, you may consume them in beverages, and if not, there's a good chance they'll show up in foods that you buy. But do they work and are they safe? If you know this area like Dr. Richard Mattis, Distinguished Professor of Nutrition Science at Purdue University. Welcome to the Leading Voices in Food podcast series. I'm Kelly Brownell, Professor of Public Policy at Duke University and Director Emeritus of the World Food Policy Center at Duke. So, Rick, thanks so much for joining us. You've done pioneering work on this area, and there are few people better positioned to discuss this topic. So I appreciate you joining us today. So let's start off with why do we need these sweeteners at all? Well, I think the primary driver here is concern about the consumption of nutritive sweeteners, sugars. It is the case that often sugars are consumed in foods that provide limited other nutritional value. So they add calories without nutrients. And then given an environment where there is concern about weight gain and obesity, there is a reasonable assumption that we can reduce sugar intake without compromising nutritional status. And so it's a good target for interventions to manage body weight. So low calorie sweeteners, as you pointed out, are one approach that can be taken to reduce sugar intake without compromising the sensory qualities of foods. And I think it's very well accepted that the sensory qualities of foods are really the primary driver of food choice. We as nutritionists would like to believe people make food choices based on nutrition. We recognize the importance of cost and convenience, but the reality is if a product does not have the right sensory properties, people just won't consume it. So we have to pay attention to the sensory properties of foods. Added sugars are presently contributing about 13% of daily energy intake. So that's a very high percent without contributing a lot of nutrients. To give you a little more perspective, at the 75th percentile in the U.S. population, that translates to about 400 kilocalories a day for males, about 300 kilocalories a day for females. And if we use a 2,000 kilocalorie diet as sort of the standard, which is what's used on food packaging labels, that represents 20% for males and 15% of energy on a daily basis. So it's very, very high. Now, the dietary guidelines advisory committee from 2020 reviewed sweeteners and their relationship to body weight. And in their modeling analyses concluded that people can really only take in something on the order of five to six percent or so of energy from added sugars without going into positive energy balance. That is taking in more energy than we need. And as a result, putting ourselves at risk for weight gain. And that is based on what it would take to obtain all the necessary nutrients in the diet if we make smart food choices. So there's very little discretionary room for added sugars. And as a result, low calorie sweeteners are a way to reduce total sugar intake, again, without compromising sensory quality. So that makes good sense. And those numbers are really quite striking. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of how much these low calorie sweeteners are consumed and how they show up in the food supply? Well, the primary source is through sweetened beverages, but there is increasing use in solid foods as well. And so they are ubiquitous in the food supply. I think that that's safe to say, but low calorie sweetened beverages are the primary source. There's been concern that these low-calorie sweeteners can disrupt carbohydrate metabolism and result in greater hunger and in food intake. What do you think about that? Yeah, this has been very extensively studied, and my interpretation of the literature is that they do not disrupt carbohydrate metabolism. We know that when people consume nutritive sweeteners, sugars, that they are absorbed, that blood sugar rises, and that elicits the release of insulin as a way to get the sugar out of the blood and into our cells. And when blood sugar levels drop and insulin levels are relatively high, that's viewed as a sort of metabolic signal that we should be hungry and be interested in eating again. However, my 
reading of the literature shows that low calorie sweeteners do not elicit a rise in insulin, do not lead to a drop in blood sugar, and as a result, don't generate a hunger signal. But even if they did that, the question is, does a rise in blood sugar or a drop in blood sugar or a rise in insulin after a typical meal really serve as the driver, the primary mechanism for generation of hunger signals? So there's an experimental approach called euglycemic clamp. We don't need to go into all of that, but suffice it to say, it's an approach that allows one to independently manipulate the level of glucose in the blood or the level of insulin in the blood. And when those studies have been done, they demonstrate unequivocally that independent changes in glucose do not alter appetitive sensations, hunger, nor do independent manipulations of insulin. So they undoubtedly change following a meal, but they are not the cause of the generation of hunger signals. Okay, so this gets right at the heart of a key question, doesn't it? Some people are saying that when you consume these artificial sweeteners, they rev up the body in a way that makes you want to eat, and you'll then consume as many calories as you might have if you've been consuming sugar or maybe even overdo it. But you're saying there's not a biological basis for that in science. That's correct. I think where there is credibility to that scenario lies more in cognitive or psychological dimension. When people use a product, a food that is reduced in energy, and we require products that we purchase to label their energy content, and often claims are made about them being low energy when they are, people are overly optimistic about the energy that they save when they consume these products, and so may be more inclined to indulge subsequent to that, and overestimating the amount of energy they save, they can indeed offset the benefit of substituting a low-calorie sweetener for a nutritive sweetener and result in higher energy intake. But that is not a biologically driven phenomenon. It therefore requires more education in terms of how to use low calorie sweeteners to better effect rather than it being a biological basis that is kind of out of people's control. If people are consuming, say, diet beverages and they're getting accustomed to a high level of sweetness because they're consuming these throughout the day, does that generalize to other parts of their diet? Might they then like other things sweeter than they might have otherwise or, you know, have sort of a drive for these things? That's correct. I think where there is credibility to that scenario lies more in cognitive or psychological dimension. When people use a product, a food that is reduced in energy and we require products that we purchase to label their energy content, and often claims are made about them being low energy when they are, people are overly optimistic about the energy that they save when they consume these products, and so may be more inclined to indulge subsequent to that, and overestimating the amount of energy they save, they can indeed offset the benefit of substituting a low-calorie sweetener for a nutritive sweetener and result in higher energy intake. But that is not a biologically driven phenomenon. It therefore requires more education in terms of how to use low calorie sweeteners to better effect rather than it being a biological basis that is kind of out of people's control. Well, that seems like a really important question to nail down, doesn't it? Because what you say about salt and fat and the dairy products and things makes all the sense in the world. And I know I've experienced that myself with low-fat dairy products compared to when I was a kid and people were drinking high-fat versions of milk and things. So if that's true and that does apply to sweetness, then you'd think the artificial sweeteners would be counterproductive because they keep people consuming sweet and not getting used to less of it over time. Does that make sense? That's a most interesting question and highly relevant right now. So there is a reasonable body of science on the effects of exposure to sensory qualities and the preferred level of that quality in foods for salt and for fat. So if one consumes high 
salt levels, foods with high levels of salt and saltiness, they generally come to like and actually prefer foods that are high in salt. And if you go on a diet that limits sensory exposure, it's not the amount of sodium actually consumed, it's the sensory exposure that determines this. So if you limit sensory exposure to salt, you can actually come to prefer low salt foods. The same is true for fat. Probably many people have exposed themselves to low fat dairy products, for example, and over time actually come to prefer them to the higher fat versions. But the story for sweeteners is still very much unknown. There is a small amount of evidence based on short-term studies with small sample sizes that would suggest that scenario holds at least in kids, but the largest and probably best controlled study to date fails to find an effect of exposure to sweetness on the preference for sweetness of foods. In contrast, they find that it alters the sensory perception, that is the intensity of sweetness, but not the preference or the liking of sweetness. So the jury is still out on that scenario. Let me ask one of the bottom line questions. So are low calorie sweeteners associated with lower or higher body weight? Yes, that's the logical conclusion. The question is whether sweetness is indeed different from salt and fat and how exposure effects work. Okay, good to know. We've been talking about these sweeteners as a group, but if we start to separate them, do the different ones have different effects on the body? So there is ammunition for different perspectives on this question. The epidemiologic data, that is the data based on surveys, pretty consistently shows that there is a positive association between consumption of low calorie sweeteners and indices of adiposity, body fatness, things like body mass index or body weight or waist circumference. However, the evidence also, in my opinion, quite convincingly and strongly shows that from randomized control trials, that consumption of low calorie sweeteners is associated with lower indices of adiposity, BMI, body weight. And in the sort of hierarchy of scientific rigor, randomized control trials are viewed as stronger than these cohort studies, these survey studies. And so in my opinion, the strongest science shows that they are associated with lower body weight rather than higher. I'm really happy you brought up that study because it's clearly a landmark study. And it's nice that you're being modest about it, but boy, it sure opens the door to some very interesting and important questions. So I appreciate you doing the study and describing it today. And if these compounds are having different effects because they're different biologically, which would make sense that they wouldn't all behave the same once they get inside the body. I'm assuming the same thing would probably be true for safety concerns. And I know over the years, there have just been lots of things in the press about worries about safety of these products. What do you think about that? Do you think these concerns are merited? So, you know, this is a very interesting area because we tend to speak about all low calorie sweeteners as though they were kind of one thing. And it's true, they all impart sweetness with very little or no energy. But does that mean that they all have the same effect in the body? We, we know, again, from other kinds of chemicals that that's not the case. For example, salt, sodium chloride, tastes salty, but is associated with elevation of blood pressure. Potassium chloride also tastes salty, but the potassium is associated with lower blood pressure. So the fact that they share a sensory property doesn't mean that they have the same physiological effect. Yet we view all these different low calorie sweeteners, which are entirely different chemical structures, as though they're the same thing. And I think that the time has come to look at them individually. And we conducted a study, Kelly Higgins was the first author on that, and compared four low calorie sweeteners and their effects on body weight. So people consume these on a daily basis for 12 weeks. We monitored body weight as well as things like hunger and appetite and, and so on. But the most important endpoint was body weight. And one of the groups consumed sugar. And we expected that if we asked people to consume sugar on a daily basis, that they would gain weight. And indeed they did. The interesting finding of the study though, was when people consumed saccharin, they also gained body weight and at a rate that was comparable to the sugar. In contrast, when they consumed Splenda, they lost body weight. 
And so by the end of 12 weeks, there was a significant difference in body weight between those consuming Splenda and those consuming saccharin. And so what this suggests is that there may indeed be substantive differences in how we respond to these different commercially available and widely consumed sweeteners. I want to emphasize that this is the one and only study that has addressed this issue, and we should never believe a single study, no matter how well done it is, until it's replicated. So I think this is an intriguing hypothesis. I think there is logic to viewing them as potentially different. Again, they all have different chemical structures, but this requires verification. Now, I guess because these products are used by so many millions of people, you'd think if there were negative effects, we'd know by now. But on the other hand, there are some of these products relatively new to the market compared to others like Splenda. And if this may not have immediate effects, but long-term effects after somebody has consumed them after many years, we may not know yet, I'm assuming. But it sounds like from your reading of the science, there are no negative effects of these at this moment. Two levels of response to that. First, I'm not a toxicologist, so you should be cautious in interpreting my perspective on it. But, you know, these sweeteners have been highly studied by the regulatory agencies of many, many nations, the European Union, the U.S., Australia, Canada, Japan, around the world, and uniformly they have concluded that when used within reasonable amounts, they are safe. And of course, that stipulation when used in reasonable amounts may be open to debate among people with different views in this area, but it's a qualification that would be used for any food or any nutrient. Any nutrient consumed at excessive levels becomes a drug and has effects very different from its role as a nutrient. So it's not unusual to put that qualification on on such a claim. However, yes, they're different chemicals. They should be evaluated independently. As a particular sweetener is petitioned for approval, regulatory agencies do review the science for its safety independently. So for the commercially available products, I think it's safe to conclude that they are safe. But as new products are developed, they will have to be evaluated on their own merits as well. You know, Rick, this has been a really interesting and important discussion because people think about these things a lot and people are concerned about their intake of these and people are using these products a lot. They're showing up in the food supply. So having a steady hand and a clear scientific mind working on these issues is really greatly appreciated. And I'm so happy that you were able to join us today and share what you know. My pleasure again, and I hope it was informative and useful. Clearly it was. Our guest today has been Dr. Richard Mattis, Distinguished Professor of Nutrition Science at Purdue University. Thank you for listening, and a special thanks to Deborah Hill for her most capable work as producer of this series. If you'd like to subscribe to Leading Voices in Food podcast series, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Podcasts and transcripts are also available on the website of the Duke World Food Policy Center. This is Kelly Brownell.